Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figured Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be talking about the fourth birthday of our friend here, the PlayStation 4. I really can't believe it's actually been four years. Like, that's a presidential term, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's a while. And it's weird, like, I, I remember it so well. I remember, like, I've been doing these videos every year since the console came out, like the, the birthday video. I'll be doing it as well for the Xbox One, and even the Wii U, believe it or not, I am actually going to do one. We'll deal with that when we get there, of course. I'm just going in calendar order. PS4 came out first in November, and then it was the Wii U, then it was the Xbox One. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I thought we'd talk about it as, as we have t tend to do. It's just blowing my mind, kind of, to be honest with you, because, I mean, like I said, I've been doing videos on it for years. I remember doing videos the day it came out, you know, the unboxing of this one right here. I remember doing videos talking about predictions of what it would even be like when it eventually did come out, you know what I'm saying? It's been a while. And for those of you who are much younger, the part of the reason that this is even stranger to me is that I grew up in a time when a console was in its fourth year, the fifth year was really dedicated to like, okay, what's the next hardware going to be like, you know what I mean? It was like, Oh, if you had the SNES and it was in its fifth year, your fourth year, you're going into the fifth, you were like, that's cool. What's the N64 going to be like? That's where we were. So, obviously, times have changed. Generations go on longer, and yet they get weirder, as you can see right there. We'll talk about that as we go. But, uh, yeah, so basically what I want to do today is just kind of talk about what the PlayStation 4 has been like for the last year or so, and kind of where I see it going in the future. Uh, and so if I had to describe this year, this will sound negative, but I swear to you it's not, let me make my case. If I had to describe the PS4 this last year, I would describe it as either mundane or uninspired. And I know both of those terms are inherently pejoratives, I know they're considered negative terms, but I actually don't mean it that way. Um, so allow me to elaborate. You first need a little backstory. The parent company of PlayStation is Sony, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Now, if you don't focus much outside of gaming, you may not know that Sony, as an entire corporation, has really not been doing that well over the past few years. PlayStation 4 is killing it, there's no one disputing that, but Sony as a corporation hasn't been doing too well. And they're doing a lot better now due to various restructuring efforts and, of course, the actual success of the PlayStation 4, which is a wonderful thing. But uh, because of that, Sony was in a position where they needed the PlayStation 4 to be successful, and once it was, history has shown us many times when a console company is at the height of their success, they do stupid, stupid things. Um, you know, when Atari was at the height of their success, they started releasing garbage left and right that eventually caused them to completely bow out of hardware completely. Um, Sony themselves is guilty of this. When the PlayStation 2 was at its height of success and they were going into the PlayStation 3, they launched it with like the dumbest logic you could ever get into which was hey let's have a let's charge six hundred dollars for a console that costs us nine hundred dollars to build don't worry about it everyone will buy it it's a playstation um it will make money back on the games you know let's make it really hard to develop for and let's do all these other things like stupid ideas sony could have done that they didn't and that's what i mean by mundane or uninspired they weren't inspired to do stupid things they just kind of said we're successful I don't know why, and you can actually look that up, that's a quote from Shuhei Yoshida. He didn't know why the PlayStation is successful. He's the president of PlayStation, he doesn't know. And the, the thing is, nobody over there really knows why, and they all, I'm sure, expected it to be successful. But to be the juggernaut that it is, nobody really saw that coming. Um, and let's not mince words. The PlayStation 4 is the undisputed winner of this generation simply by console sold. Uh, the Xbox One, if it were not for the fact that it's owned by Microsoft, an entity with seemingly infinite money, the Xbox One would be gone. It's considered a, almost socially irrelevant. Um, it exists because of who owns it. Uh, the Wii U, of course, was smashed to pieces. Despite the greatness of that console, and I love that particular console, it didn't have a ghost of a chance. Now, this, there's an argument that could be made for the Switch. We'll have to debate that in the future, perhaps. That said, PlayStation 4 is on top, just from a console sales point alone. So that, that was prime. That was prime for Sony to do something stupid. But they didn't. They just kind of rode the wave and said, we're not going to rock the boat. We're just going to kind of keep whatever's working here, this odd balance, we're going to keep that going. So I have a few different examples to cite to kind of make my case here. Um, Sony did a few things this year that were, in my opinion, really great. 
some that were kind of strange, and then some that, you know, were, I guess, interesting, but not, didn't end up being much. So let me make uh, my first point about that. The thing that I have wanted out of the PlayStation 4, aside from the obvious, we all agree on this, I'm sure every single one of us agrees, if we buy a game console, we want good games. We all get that one. We'll talk about the games in a bit. But other things, the other things you can do with a console. The thing I wanted the most, and I think I even said it all the way back in my first unboxing video of this particular machine, was I want external hard drive support. Um, for those some who somehow don't know, uh, the PlayStation 4 does not, when you put a game disc in it, it doesn't read the data off the disc. It downloads the game data off the disc onto a hard drive. Um, the Xbox One does this as well. Um, but the Xbox One allowed you, if you didn't have enough space on the internal hard drive, hey, no problem, just connect another hard drive that you bought at a store, doesn't matter who made it, whatever, uh, Western Digital, Seagate, we don't care. Plug it into your, uh, your Xbox One, your Xbox will format it, and then you can just install games on that, you're good to go. Sony wouldn't let, that, let us have that. Instead, what Sony did is they uh, basically left you a space here where you could put in your own hard drive, which was a great feature, don't get me wrong. It's awesome that you could swap out their hard drive with a new one, but it was never sufficient um, because, first of all, it's massively inconvenient to have to do that, reformat it, reinstall everything, all that shit. Um, the backup and restore feature, frankly, was never that good. In fact, mine got corrupted in the process of moving these th things around. I lost a lot of stuff. Um, but also, it essentially had a size limit. Uh, the biggest hard drives that fit in this thing is a two terabyte, basically, laptop drive. Um, while system software allows for bigger drives, you can only really do it by kind of Frankensteining it in there with various cables and stuff, and it never really looked good. It didn't look natural. It worked, yes, but it wasn't really a solution. External hard drive support was a solution for allowing you to just kind of keep installing games and never have to worry about deleting them and all that stuff. And about six months ago, Sony finally gave us that. They were three and a half years late to the party, but they showed up. And I give them credit for doing finally the right thing, because it has made the gaming experience on a PlayStation console, or a PlayStation 4 console, a vastly better experience. So I'm very happy that they finally did that one. So, But that wasn't rocking the boat. That was kind of just giving people what they kept saying they wanted. And I don't know what Sony's resistance was to that, other than maybe piracy. But uh, beyond that, I don't know. But finally they gave it to us, so that's good. Now, the one thing, they, they did two things that you could argue rock the boat a little bit. Um, but let me make my case here about one in particular. What Sony did not do this year, that I'm happy about, is they didn't go out there and put out a bunch of weird, stupid peripherals, weird accessories, and stupid things that we didn't need and we knew would fail, but they were going to just try anyway in case they got lucky. They didn't gamble. That was smart. Um, they didn't put out, like, uh, hey, Nintendo's gonna do this like portable thing. Maybe we should just like really quickly together put like a new Vita console together that like goes on a dock and like and then lose a shit ton of money on that concept. They didn't do that. They stayed out of that. Um, the, the closest they came to that was PlayStation VR. Now PlayStation VR was is interesting, not because it was successful, but also because it didn't really fail. It just kind of fell in the middle. Um, now, PlayStation VR, by far, was the most successful of all the VR sets. The thing about VR is I personally, people ask me many times if I thought it was the future of gaming, and I always laughed and said, no, it's not the future of gaming. And it, it really wasn't, and it really isn't. Um, because, I mean, maybe in some you know, way distant future with a completely different iteration of it, but this version of it is not. Um, but... Play, like things like HTC Vive and Oculus Rift, I mean, those are vastly superior VR experiences, but they require so much, not only financially, but literal physical space limitations. Like, you need rooms dedicated to it. I've used it in the Primo experiences, things at like Facebook's headquarters, uh, things at like Machinima's headquarters, uh, Ubisoft's headquarters. I've done those things in those places, and there where they have like tons of money and it's even their product in some cases. It's like, it's still, it was never the most exciting experience to me. And then, of course, I've used the PlayStation 4, um, the PlayStation VR unit as well at things like conventions. I've even had one briefly on my other channel to, to make certain videos with. And it is by far the least technologically capable of all of them. But Sony, again, they were smart about it. They rode the middle. They said, look, it looks like VR might be a thing and we need something to be a little bit different, let's go with a very modest 
very financially responsible version of that concept. So they gave us PlayStation VR, which was not by any means the best VR experience, but it was the most affordable one. And as a result, it was the most successful. But at the same time, it wasn't a big hit. It just kind of did okay, and that was good enough. It, it made Sony look more interesting. It made the brand overall look more appealing. It didn't get annoying. It didn't get in your face. I mean, it was in your face, but only if you're wearing it. But I mean by that, it wasn't like a forced experience thing. Yes, there are games that require it. Let's not kid ourselves. But it wasn't a thing like where every game forced you to buy it. Um, you knew what you were getting if you were going out of your way to get a VR game. And you still know that. They, they brand it very clearly on that box. And I, again, I appreciate that effort. They don't kind of hide it or whatever. They don't shoehorn it into stuff too much. And I appreciate that. Um, so, and of course, again, because it was modestly priced by comparison to all the others, and it was much more easy to use, it did the best. That said, they're, I wouldn't say they're done with it, but it's not really that important. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a priority for them anymore. So what I would say is I noticed that people either have one of two opinions on VR, uh, especially PlayStation VR. It's either, oh, I fucking love it. You know, I love it. Like, I, I want all the games. I think it's great. I don't know why more companies don't do this. And then there's just, I don't give a shit. I have yet to see anybody say they fucking hate it. And that's different. That's a different vibe. It's more like, you have already, by the time PlayStation VR was out, most people had already made up their minds if they even cared about the concept. I'm one of them. I've used it, but even before I used it, I decided I didn't care. I used it because I had to. And then when I played it, I got exactly what I expected, which is, I don't care about this. And then there's people I know, personally, who are like, I bought one and I love it because I love this whole concept of VR and it's crazy to me. That's who they made it for. It's just that that audience wasn't that big. But because of that, it was smart to keep it cheap. So I, I can't knock them for that. They did okay on that. They didn't take a huge loss, but they didn't, you know, really make a shit ton of money either. So that's uh, another example of them kind of riding the wave, being mundane, in the middle, you know, it's safe. Play it safe. Again, I consider that a smart move, especially when they could really screw it up, but they're not. Um, and then uh, the other thing that they did, well, that should be really obvious, it's right here, the PlayStation 4 Pro. Now, when the PS4 Pro was first announced, a lot of people were highly confused as to what this thing was going to be. And understandably so. Hell, I was one of them. It was unprecedented. With the exception of the new 3DS that added little, a couple of additional features of hardware in it to allow it to play certain games that previous uh, 3DS, 3DS models couldn't play, like uh, Xenoblade Chronicles or whatever, that concept really didn't exist. This console basically broke the most cardinal rule of game consoles. Love game consoles, hate game consoles, whatever your opinion is. The, one of the nice things to a lot of us, a lot of console gamers, I know PC gamers feel differently about this, but console gamers have always liked the idea of essentially neutrality on the console. Meaning, I buy a console, regardless of what it is, I buy a Sega Saturn. I know that every single Sega Saturn game that exists is going to work on it, uh, yes, you might need a special controller here, you might need that modem there, you know, whatever that is, the little accessories, but the console, the console is going to be consistent. Um, there might be small exceptions there if you have like a slim model or something like that, but essentially it's always the same thing, and as long as they keep making games, that game will always work there. The PlayStation 4 Pro broke that rule by saying, you know what, this is the regular, and this version over here has additional hardware in it. It can do so many things this one can't. And if we wanted to, we could make games just for this that do not work on that. Almost like it is the PlayStation 5. Of course it's not, but almost like it was. And that really pissed off a lot of people, and, it, and a lot of people got really excited about it. It was just a confusing time. And a lot of people speculated as to what the future of all of this meant. And we still are, because... The Xbox One X just came out, and we're in essentially the same boat, where we don't really know where it's, what's going to play out with that. But none of those nightmares, I think a lot of the worst case scenarios that people were putting out there ever came to be. Um, partially because the PS4 Pro was not exactly what it was kind of speculated to be. A lot of people thought that this was going to be like this perfect 4K capable gaming console with its own exclusive library of games and all this stuff. Um, it was none of those things, at least not yet. Now, it's certainly not... 4K gaming capable. It's certainly nowhere even as capable as the X1, uh, Xbox One X, and obviously beyond that, there's you know PCs that are capable of way beyond that. Um, it's none of those things. 
Um, it didn't have its own exclusive library of games, at least not yet. What it has been is exactly what it needed to be. And again, why Sony was smart this time around with this particular move. They didn't rock the boat. They basically said, look, we're going to put out all these games. Uh, we're even going to support older games we've already released. And what's going to happen is every single one of them, you got a PS4 basic model, it's going to work just fine on there. But if you have the Xbox, if you have the PS4 Pro, it's going to have higher resolution. It's going to have better frame rate. You know, it's going to run with bigger, better textures, that kind of thing. Um, I am yet to see, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm yet to see a PS4 game that came out. It played on the PS4, but it was like buggy and shitty and didn't really work right. But on PS4 Pro, it was the perfect smooth experience. No. It has been just, oh, it works here. It just works better here. Um, and that's, again, good. It just gave you the option. Now, again, things could change. We're only a year in, and the Xbox One X hadn't been out yet. We might see developers say, like, look, man, the Xbox One base and the PS4 base are just, they're done. We can't deal with them anymore. We can put this game on Xbox One X. We can squeeze it onto PS4 Pro, but we can't go any lower. That could still happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Again, being smart. To me, this whole year for Sony has felt like the link year between 2016 and 2018. Like, it, it's like the weird episode in a trilogy or something. Like, it's Back to the Future 2. It's the one that links Back to the Future 1 and 3. You know what I mean? That's how it's felt. And if you don't believe me, if you're not seeing that same vibe, I invite you to go back and watch the E3 press conferences from this year. From both, from all from Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony. All three of them are kind of exactly how I feel ultimately happened this year. Microsoft came out, it really didn't have anything worthwhile game-wise, but they still came out and gave you a good show. They presented themselves well, and they made a couple of exciting announcements where like, shit, I didn't see that one coming, like original Xbox backwards compatibility, stuff like that. It was surprising, it was exciting, it was invigorating. They were trying, they just didn't necessarily have the games. Nintendo came out and they were in their usual Nintendo way of being weird and that guy in the corner who's like really good at making art but nobody ever talks to him because he's a fucking lunatic. Like that was Nintendo. You know, they came out and said like, we got all these cool games, you didn't even know we were working on them. Metroid Prime 4 is kind of, like you know, stuff like that. You're like, shit, that was exciting. They had some cool announcements over there. Their work's uh, great, it's too bad they're a lunatic. That was how Nintendo always comes across. And it's been true with them. You know, their games come out and they're great but all their policies are moronic. Um, yet they just succeed despite that. Sony's conference was very, very cookie cutter. It came out, the, the, I remember what happened, the guy came out and he was like, hello, I am with PlayStation, we're very excited to have you here. Oh my god, we can't even believe how excited we are. Anyway, we have some games, look at some footage. These games were all shown last year, but here's more footage of them, they're further along. Like he did it because he felt obligated to, because it had to happen. <laughs> And that is not a knock against them. I, I keep saying this. It was a good move because they didn't have anything to excite or rock the boat with. And that's not bad in this context. What it essentially means is next year will probably be great for them because they have a whole big library of games that will drop next year. Now this year they had worthwhile titles and I'm not saying they didn't. You know, they had things like Last Guardian. They had things like Horizon Zero Dawn, which were quality games. And I gotta give it to them, they did just fine in that department, but that's my point. They did just fine. They did exactly what they needed to do. They didn't fuck up, but they didn't blow you away. They didn't promise you things they couldn't deliver, and they didn't just make garbage either. They sat right there in the middle and said, we're gonna give you this game, okay, we gave you the game. And I think that worked just fine for them because they wanna stay on the top there. Especially in a year where they're kind of waiting on Xbox One X, or they were, I should say, just to, they need to stay on the top there. They need to play it smart for that year. It was a good move. Um, now, unfortunately, with games like that, you know, they, as much as Last Guardian was fun, um, it was a perfect, unfortunately, it was a perfect textbook example of why video game companies don't always listen to fans. Because while we demanded that game for years because we kept seeing it, it kept coming up, it was almost a reoccurring joke for a long time. We were always like, yeah, we'll be on board with that game. We want that game. We need that game. When it was finally out, people didn't really buy it. It did okay-ish, but it really was not as successful as I'm sure they wanted it to be. It's one of those things where a lot of us scream about something, but we're never really there to back it up with our wallets. And it's because it's one of those games that just doesn't appeal to mainstream, which is unfortunate. That's a lot of what 
business decisions are, are banking upon in the video game industry and, and, and like most businesses really they don't bank on the fans they like to make the fans happy but really they're banking on the 90 percent who aren't fans because their money is bigger um, if you want to put it that way um, so that was a perfect example that now Horizon Zero Dawn was able to overcome that but that was more of a big blockbuster move for them and it was smart on their part to release it when they did they put it up against uh, Breath of the Wild and they, of course, you know, jabbed at Microsoft for canceling Scalebound around the exact same time. Scalebound was, I kind of think, originally due, I mean originally due, uh, around that time. So you have these big, like, three RPGs kind of going up against each other, and then Microsoft just bowed out of that one completely. And while I'm sure most people would consider Breath of the Wild the better game, Horizon Zero Dawn had nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> like, and it, it came out around the same time, and it gave PlayStation fans something to not be super jealous of and not to leave... PlayStation for Nintendo over. And that was good. Again, playing the line, playing it safe, being smart. And I, that's what I really appreciate about Sony this year, was just the, they were analytical. And I liked that. Now, uh, as for some predictions, um, I will say that I think, I'm going to say it now, I think that, I kind of already alluded to it, but I think 2018 is going to be a very good year to be a PlayStation owner. Um, because while I think there is absolutely no threat that Microsoft can overcome the, the hurdle that exists, um, there is an argument to be made that maybe the Switch could, but certainly not within the next year. I think Sony is kind of ready to try a little harder to, um, to excite people. Um, and they will be not in the underdog position of success, but they'll be in the underdog position of hardware. The Xbox One X indisputably is a more capable machine than the PS4 Pro, but that may not matter. Because my other prediction is, I think the PS4 Pro is going to sell better next year than it did this year. This year, PS4 Pro was like confusing. It was something we weren't really sure how much better it is, what the future of this is, why are you doing a half-step console, what is this? While at the same time, we all knew Xbox One X or Scorpio at the time was coming. So we're all kind of sitting there waiting, like, do we wait, you know, what's the deal? Now that it's out, and now that Xbox One X is $500, and that's more than most people want to pay, Sony is in a good position where their console base price is $100 cheaper. And on top of that, I'm calling it now, I think they're going to drop the price this holiday season, maybe even permanently, $50, maybe even $100 if they're smart, or $50 and then include a couple of games or something like that, um, in an effort to kind of undercut Microsoft's attempt to kind of overthrow. Um, that's what I would see happen for the next year is that Sony's going to come out and be like, yeah, yeah, it's not quite as beefy, but check it out. It's 200 bucks cheaper. Come on. Come on. Um, I, and I think that's a smart move, especially if they bundle it with some legit titles. Um, I, that's kind of how I see that playing out. I think, I think that Sony really doesn't have to worry about PS4 Pro tanking or PS, PlayStation tanking to Microsoft. Again, Switch, potentially a different story, but it's way too early to make that call. Um... My fantasy is not fantasy prediction, which is not a real prediction because I don't think this will happen, but I want it to. I would love it. I know it won't happen. I would love it if Sony would finally give us actual backwards compatibility. For those who don't know, uh, the Xbox One, because Microsoft is in the underdog position, which by the way, the underdog position is typically makes for the more exciting game console because they're losing. They try everything to make you love them, so they give you all sorts of crazy shit. Uh, they usually try a lot harder. Throughout history, that's how it typically works. Um, it's, I mean, not, it's not even a, there's no like, one side is better than the other here. It's not like, oh, Microsoft is better, or Sony sucks, or no stupid shit. Like, last generation, it was exactly the opposite. When the Xbox 360 was on top, they did dumb shit. They started saying like, oh, you know what, let's uh, put Dorito and uh, Mountain Dew ads and everything, and, uh, you know, at the same time, Sony was like, look, PlayStation 3 is complicated, but tell you what, we're just going to focus on the games. I actually argue that PlayStation 3 might, in my opinion, be one of the best, if not the best, PlayStation hardware. I know that's taboo to a lot of people. But they tried so hard to give you really good gaming experiences with the PlayStation 3, because that's what they had. They needed you. Microsoft didn't need you, and so they started fucking with you. Um, and then that arrogance stayed with them when they went into the Xbox One originally. We all remember the horrible DRM nightmare that was the original Xbox One. Um, so right now, it's reversed. 
So Microsoft's trying really hard with things like backwards compatibility. They're giving, they're giving you away, giving away the ability to play Xbox 360 games on Xbox One. Now, original Xbox games on Xbox One. The idea that you can take a 15-year-old original Xbox disc, provided that the game has to actually be supported, stick that into your Xbox One and play it is insane. The fact that that's a new thing, and they just started doing that. Sony has had a similar program for a while. Now, granted, PS3 is not supported and probably never will be because it's too complex for something like the PlayStation 4 to handle, even the PlayStation 4 Pro. It's too unique of hardware. Um, maybe if they do another iteration of PlayStation 4 or something, PlayStation 4 Pro Ultimate or some shit, but that's a different story. But there's no real reason they can't give you PS1 and PS2 support. They sh simply choose not to. What they have been doing instead is the digital resell you the game uh, plan. Now, for those who are uninitiated, let's take the game Psychonauts. Psychonauts was originally released on both the PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox. And in both cases, that game exists on PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade Store. Xbox Store, sorry, using old terms. Uh, Xbox Store. So, in both cases, you can go online, buy the game digitally, and it'll download to your console. On, you can play it on your PS4, or you can play it on your Xbox One. However, both games originally existed on the PS2 and original Xbox. With the Xbox One, you stick in that 15-year-old original Xbox disc in your Xbox One, you're good. You just download it for free, it's fine. You don't have to pay for it. PlayStation 2 disc, you put that in, LOL, that's funny, buy me. And there's no real reason for that other than Sony just doesn't want to give away that feature for free. Um, and I wish they would. I get why they don't. I get it. It makes them money. And if you're paying that support, if you're paying for those digital PS2 and PS1 games, you are the reason that we are not getting that service for free. Now, if you're supporting the Xbox program, you are the reason we will keep getting more games because they see that there's money to be made while still giving it away for free. Sony's doing exactly the opposite, and I hate that. So I would really love to see that backwards compatibility in there, and I hopefully see that. Hopefully you see why that's nice. It would be nice to be able to play those games. I get why they don't do it. That's why it's my fantasy, but I'd love it if it happened. Um, and so with that, I'm going to leave you with just a couple of other random predictions here. I think that in late 2018, we will see a PS4 Pro Slim, not PS4 Pro Ultimate, where it's like the next iteration of PlayStation 4. It'll just be PlayStation 4 Slim. It'll be the same thing, but smaller, cheaper, whatever. Um, probably to compete around that time. Um, I also kind of want to talk, this is not really directly on target here, but I kind of want to talk about PlayStation 5. Because I think, my, my, my belief on this has changed. For the longest time I maintained that PS5, if it were to happen, it would be a little Roku-sized digital box called PS5, and it would be entirely internet dependent as a streaming service or maybe a thing where you just download digital titles exclusively. I no longer believe that. Um, and the reason I don't believe that now, I have changed my opinion on this. I think that we will get a PS5. I think it will be a traditional console that uses physical discs. It may not be Blu-rays, and maybe the next generation of Blu-ray might be like a 300 gigabyte disc or whatever. But I think that will happen. I would bet on it happening maybe in 2020. And the reason I think this is not the reason most people tend to state. What I, over the years when I've made that claim, a lot of people have argued uh, that, no, 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 we're going to get it definitely because PlayStation is successful, why would they give up on PlayStation? That was never my case, though people misinterpreted it as such. I believed that Sony would never give up on PlayStation as a brand. That was never the argument. I simply believed they would evolve it into either a little digital streaming service or they'd use it as an app. You know, you'd stick it in a PC, like a Steam competitor, or for a while there, Sony was experimenting by putting PlayStation Now in just televisions. It was an app in televisions um, and all sorts of like, you know, tablets and things like that. And I really thought that that was their future. And I still think it is, but not yet. And the reason isn't because of the usual argument that, oh, but internet access in the States is just not ready for that. It's not the States. I used to think that was a possibility too. The States is more capable. The issue is Japan. I've been to Japan twice this year. Can't say I expected that to happen, but it happened. And what I learned was the Japanese, despite I'm sure a lot of us who've never been there, 
typically think of Japan as like this technological paradise. It's not. It's more like the 80s had evolved a different way, where the home computer never took off. And I mean the PC not as a gaming device, but as like a thing you have in your house for any sort of task management. In Japan, PCs don't really exist. It's not really a thing. Um, laptops are not really a thing, and if, if they have them, they're, for, they're essentially digital typewriters. That's all they're really perceived as. Um, and what I'm essentially saying by that is, the technology and internet infrastructure over there is not there. It's not ready. You can't have PlayStation evolve into a PC app when PCs don't exist really in Japan. It's not, it's not something Sony would do in their own home country. It's just illogical. Now, we have to understand that I still believe that that was Sony's plan all along, was to go digital completely. And some of my evidence of that was that the PlayStation 4 was actually American designed. Mark Cerny designed this, you know, along with another team of American engineers. It was more or less just approved by Sony of Japan, because Sony of Japan had done all the previous ones. Um, I really think that Sony of America's intention was exactly what I was describing, by making it all digital and all that stuff, eventually. And I think the PS4 Pro might have been kind of this half step to buy Japan more time to get there infrastructurally. But it's not there. And it's not going to be there anytime soon. Which is why I now believe, look to 2020 for a physical disc console called the PlayStation 5. But what I hope is, it's an actual PlayStation 5. Consoles are events. They are things to to be respected as upcoming major events in gaming, as opposed to something like the PS4 Pro or the PS4 Slim, which is just a reiteration or a slight upgrade, if you will, to an existing machine. What I don't want to see is Sony doing a stupid marketing move where they take the PlayStation 4 Pro Ultimate that I keep joking about and call it PS5. I don't know, but it's also backwards compatible with PS4. Isn't that cool? Don't tell them it's actually just a beefier PS4. I don't want to see that shit. I want to see the next generation of a real machine. Sure, make it backwards compatible, that's all fine and good. Just don't lie about what it actually is. Um, and that's why I, I'm hoping that that's, they're in the same mindset and they do that probably in 2020. That's how I see that playing out. But granted, that's much further away. So, I guess that's, I guess that's kind of it. Um, PS4, man... Uh, you know, it's a good console. Uh, hopefully it has a good year. That's what I think is going to happen. And uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying yours. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, again, we'll be doing this for the Wii U. I know that's essentially pointless, but why the hell not? It'll be kind of fun to chat about it. There's not much to say, but it'll be fun. And then, of course, we'll be doing this on the Xbox One as well. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all later.